I have a question for you. Do you like to find new free stuff for your family history? Well, then you are in the right place because that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. I am Lisa Louise Cook, and this is Elevenses with Lisa. <clears throat> this is the place to settle in with your favorite cuppa, join our genealogy community here at Genealogy Gems, and discover your family history. And um, speaking of the Genealogy Gems community, in fact, I just put this in the live chat, I hope that you have subscribed to our channel. And the reason I mentioned that is, is because I did some checking and it turns out 38% of you who regularly watch have subscribed. Thank you so much. You can't believe how much that helps support the show. But 62% of you have a job to do today. Click the red subscribe button under the video. And if you are watching uh, later after the live show from our, our website, genealogygems.com, it's super easy still to get back to YouTube and click that button to help support us. Just click YouTube in the bottom right hand corner of the video on the page. It'll jump you right over here to the Genealogy Gems YouTube channel and you can click that red button. I so appreciate it. It's super quick and easy to do. Makes a big difference. So today we are going to, uh, oh, and here's my little, thank you, I made it work, thank you. <laughs> okay, today we are going to head over to the Internet Archive. This is going to be so much fun. I'm really excited about it because uh, the more you dig into it, the more you discover there's so much for genealogy. And today I've got 10 must-have genealogy records for you from the Internet Archive. Now, if you haven't been there before, it's at archive.org. And of course, this video along with the show notes will be over at our website uh, later this weekend after the live show, genealogygems.com slash elevenses. So don't worry if you got your hands full with uh, a cup of coffee or your phone or whatever you're doing, don't worry because we put the show notes together for you and I will have links and information on everything that we talk about. Okay, but first, you gotta have a free account. Now, this is fairly new to me because I've been using the Internet Archive for a long time, but without an account. And it turns out there are some great advantages. So before I show you your 10 records that you gotta have, I wanna make sure that you click in the right-hand, upper right corner of the website. And uh, are we working okay? My Good. video resolution is really low, but oh, it looks okay on It computer. looks okay on my computer, hopefully. If, if you're having trouble on the live stream, click refresh on the page. That might do the trick in terms of improving the image. So the benefits of the free account are um, that you can check out eBooks, and there's a lot of them. I'm going to show you how to get a hold of those. You can also save favorites, and the more you dig in, particularly after our little chat here today, the more you're going to want to be able to find those favorite items again and again. You can also upload stuff, which is really interesting. If you have something that's very unique in your own genealogy collection, a G Internet Archive would be an ideal place to upload it and make it available also to other people. And of course, uh, they have recommended websites. So if you would like to recommend a website that you would like to see archived, maybe it's your own family history blog or website, get in touch with them, ask them to archive it. And that way it will be there, uh, copies of it even well beyond uh, the time that you run that particular blog or website. So again, we are at archive.org. So let's jump into our first item. Uh, how about church records? And if you have been a long time or even short time viewer of Elevens with Lisa, you know that we covered this very recently with my friend, Sonny Morton. And that was in episode number 41. So it got me thinking, of course, right out of the gate, when I went to the Internet Archive to put this together, hmm, could I find some of these church records that Sonny was talking about? Absolutely. Okay, so over here at archive.org, I just typed in Lutheran church history just to kind of get a sense. So you could put in any particular denomination. You could just put in church history just to kind of start, kind of play with it and see what works for, for what you're in search of. And this is an international website, obviously. 
So if you're in Canada, we know we have viewers in England and Australia, do the same thing. You can put in locations, you can put in the denomination of a church, uh, and you will find all kinds of things. Here we see um, many old church histories. Gosh, there's over seven, well, there's 797 results as of yesterday um, for that. And then also church meeting minutes. I think these are very cool because even if uh, they have just under 3,000 of these, each one is chock full of names and activities and events going on at churches all around the world. So really interesting stuff. Um, some very unique things. And we're going to talk more about kind of who's posting this information and maybe how that could also lead you to finding more stuff. But just know that when you get done watching episode 41 and you see what Sunday Morton has can show you about what you can do with these church records and the and the uh, challenges they can solve for you, you are going to want to hustle over to the Internet Archive and see if they have some of those records waiting for you. OK, so our second must have record and really I call them records, but it's really just general themes. What's the theme of records that you're looking for? And let's talk about family records. So family records can include many things. Uh, one example would just be going in and typing family history and maybe putting in a surname. Now, again, depending on if your surname is fairly unique or very, very common, you know, you could try just the surname. I, as I've mentioned many times before, I have Sparowskis in my family. Well, there's not a lot of Sparowskis around the world. So it's really interesting to me just to put in that family name. That's not going to work so well with Jones, but you get my feel here. We can add Jones and family history. That might give us a little something. Notice nearly 60,000 hits just on the term family history. You're going to want to filter more. And you can see that on the left hand side of the screen, there are ways to kind of filter down on time frame and topics and subjects and also the type of content. So we see a lot of books at the Internet Archive, but we also see other types of text documents, um, images, movies, videos, collection software. I mean, all kinds of stuff. So this is just kind of a general way to dip your toes in there. And let's go for something that um, I learned about really early on in my family histories research back when I was a kid, actually, somebody told me about compiled family history. I don't think these are as much on the radar of today's genealogists, particularly if you've started in the last five or 10 years, because we don't, we tend to get kind of focused in on the websites and individual records and we forget there are people who did a lot of work oftentimes well before we came along and they've compiled that in a family history. Thankfully, there are many, many of these on the Internet Archive. So again, it does depend on the terms that somebody uses when they upload their information. So if, if an individual person is uploading a compiled family history that they've written up, they might not put in the word compiled. They might not think of it that way. So play with the terms, the surnames, uh, the time frames, and I think that you'll have um, some good success in finding some really interesting books here. And of course, in Elevens is with Lisa, episode 29, we talked about family Bibles. I hope you watched that episode. To me, it was it was fascinating to research it and put it together for you. And one of the places we talked about where you can find old family Bibles is over at Internet Archive. So simply putting in this term. Now, you notice what I did this time? I put the quotation marks around family Bible. And we do that over at google.com when we're searching. We're trying to explain to the search engine, hey, we want this phrase. We don't just want the word family <clears throat> and the word Bible. And it turns out that there's kind of no connection, no context with this. We want it to be a phrase so that will really narrow things down, but more importantly, give you a lot better quality results. And you can see here, gosh, real old family Bibles. Now, 
you're going to see different things. You're going to see digitized images of Bibles themselves. People put the Bible down on the table and they started digitizing. But you're also going to see transcriptions. You're also going to see individual pages just from the family history pages in the old family Bible. So they're not digitizing the entire Bible, which of course is huge. They're just doing the pages that families for, for centuries have been writing the births, the deaths, the marriages, the other major events in their family, in their family Bible. Sometimes those pages are found in the front. Sometimes they're in the middle of the Bible. Uh, we click on this one. This is the Streepy Family Bible, and uh, they've digitized the pages with the, the actual handwriting. Really, to understand family Bibles, you got to watch episode 29 because we talk about how to really interpret what this means and the validity of it and uh, do so much more. So I hope you'll check that out. And when you get into clicking a particular item, you can find it. It's really like reading a book. You can click and just flip the pages. This one is a great example of those transcriptions. Somebody later typed up the information they were finding in old family Bibles. And it could be a whole community. It could be from a particular church. It could be just one family and multiple Bibles throughout their family. So lots of different variations. You never know what you're going to find, but it's really um, fun to be able to read it. This one, you don't have to borrow. You can just read it right then, turn the pages, you can see the pages. You'll see a kind of a black screen. It'll say preview if it turns out that you can't um, do it without borrowing the book but I'll show you how to do that in just a moment. <clears throat> so our next item, number three, are location-based records. Wow, this could kind of cover the whole gamut, but what I really wanted to do was get you thinking about what are the locations associated with your family history and what kinds of records would be generated based on the fact that they were coming from one locality. Okay. So let's just start with a place. Uh, I typed in Regina, Saskatchewan, which is where uh, the Cooks immigrated to from Huntington, England, over to um, Saskatchewan in 1912. And so here you can see that um, I've gotten lots of great stuff, all kinds of historical pictures. There's audio I can see there, the kind of the audio wave, um, books, I mean, it's amazing I got this prepped for the show because <laughs> I was just gonna like, I kept going down rabbit holes. I kept finding things. I would go running into Bill's office. Look what I found. You're gonna feel the same way when you dig into this and just start putting some of these locations. It's important to get to know the location where your ancestors lived so that you understand the history. What's, what's the environment that they're living in and that can impact decisions that they made. Here's another example of Grunwald in Ortelsburg. Now, this is in East Prussia. My great-grandmother was born there, and I just wanted to see if I could find anything. Uh, it was interesting. I got a couple of items, and I got the option. I think it detected that the description of these items was in German. So the Google Translate, you can see it there at the top, just kind of popped down and said, oh, do you want to translate this into English? Now, I wish that it would translate the whole book or the whole newspaper. Wouldn't that be amazing? It doesn't. But what it can do is it can translate the text of the description and the title. So at least you know what this document is about, whether it's going to be relevant to your family history and something that you want to dig into further. If you want to learn more about when you find an item that is a match, how do I translate the pages, check out my book, The Genealogist Google Toolbox. We go into in-depth uh, Google Translate in the book. And there's a couple of different ways you can use Translate um, very creatively to try to get these things uh, translated for you. Okay, so here's another location in my family, Randolph County, Indiana. I just tapped in the word history to see if, what that would do. It did a nice job of bringing many different um, documents and books. We have church materials here, historical papers from individuals and branches of libraries, um, history books. Um, so lots to work with. I, 
particularly these days where we're kind of spending more time at home, it's, it's really neat to be able to have this kind of variety from around the world available right here from home uh, at the Internet Archive and, and maybe even to be able to borrow some of these books. If it turns out that they actually came from a library that you don't have access to, wow, this really helps solve that problem, doesn't it? And another location-based item would be a directory, like a city directory, right? It's all about who lives in the community. City directories are your friends because they fill in all the years between the census records. We know the census is every 10 years or so, right, every 10 years, but when you can go into a city directory and you can see it year by year, and you find out what was happening. Why do I see them in 1910, but I don't see them in 1920? We might be able to see more going on and when the move happened. Uh, and also for years like 1890, where the census was essentially destroyed here in the US, we've got city directories potentially in the areas where your ancestors lived to help fill in that gap. This one, yay, I was doing a happy dance. Okay, so this is Henderson's Regina City Directory from 1913, and there is Harry Cook, my husband's great-grandfather, working, and this was interesting, as a wireman at Northwestern Electric. So that was very cool to discover and kind of validated another piece of information I had found about where he was working, and this kind of put the, uh, the icing on that cake. And of course, you can't talk about location without talking about maps. We love old maps and have talked about them here on the show, in particularly using Google Earth. So maps, let's just type in plat map. Now, a plat map, right, back in, particularly in the 19th century, we saw a lot of these uh, in our old county histories here in the U.S. Um, this is where they're documenting who owns the property at any given time. Now, down here, you can click to zoom in. So if it's, this is the kind of document where you really want to get in up close and they're beautifully, highly digitized, really high resolution. So you can do that. You can zoom in really well. Over here on the left hand side, we can even type in some text and we can try to search, although that's not going to work so well on an image like this, but we can download it. So this allows me to download this map as a PDF straight to my computer. We can also do that in the upper right hand corner. So here we're just downloading, I think this is from 1882 in Wisconsin. And um, how wonderful to, to have it, or 1893 it says here, and be able to download it and use it uh, and include it with our family history. Now, down below, here's just another way to do it. And there's many different types of files. So depending on how you might want to use the map, Maybe there is another version that you want to get here. Notice that it comes from this collection. It's part of the Wisconsin History Collection. Don't miss this, okay? When you find a great record, go down below. They're going to give you like a little timeline uh, feeder that shows you other items that might be lined up with what you're looking at. And you can also click through to the collection that it's part of. So think of it like that thread or just pulling that thread to see where it leads us or unravels us. Here, Wisconsin history. Oh, if I like that plat map, I'm going to love a lot of the stuff that's here. So use these links and feeder kind of re recommended related items as a way to bring you more easily to other content that is also in the uh, arena that you're interested in. Okay, number four. Oh my gosh, can you believe there's this much over at the Internet Archive already? We are just getting started, my friend. Okay, number four is school records. And there's, just like church records or anything else, there's a lot of different kinds, and you can find them at Internet Archive. How about a student newspaper? I think these are so interesting. Um, again, one document, but really chock full of all kinds of names and details about everyday life at that school. So if you type in student newspaper, then you can start using the filters over on the left hand side and maybe do a little more filtering down. We can add in the name of the school. Um, we could put in just the town. Because you know, we don't always know when the name of a school changed 
or the name of the newspaper changed. Maybe you are familiar with one issue of a newspaper and you want to see if there's more. Use that title, but then also go back and just do student newspaper and the town and see if by chance that name changed over years. I've seen that a couple times in my own family history. So uh, that way you don't miss anything. So student newspapers, you got to love these. Some of these, unbelievable, they go so far back. When you click through, it, it reads just like a book again. We've got that paging to the right, to the left. We can look at side-by-side -side pages. We can do individual and zoom in. We can, um, in the bottom right-hand corner of the screen, we could click that checkerboard. Just like in Google Books, it's like a thumbnail view. So it gives you a chance to kind of get an overview of how much is here. Are there pictures? Are there maps? Uh, is there an index or a table of contents? So much faster to spot that kind of stuff if you click that checkerboard thumbnail button in the bottom right hand corner of the viewer. Do that first. Get your bearings and then dig into the paper. And of course, these also can be downloaded most of the time. And here we put in yearbooks. So just putting it in the name of the school, Rock Creek High School, we got 20 yearbooks. Uh, they, now there might be more than one Rock Creek, but we can go through these pretty easily. We can also use the filters to um, thin them down if we need to. So one more place. Certainly they, all of the items we're talking about, absolutely, they can be found in many different locations. What I love about Internet Archive is just the wide range, the ability to make them favorites, um, to borrow items that maybe weren't available or just were preview over somewhere else. Um, there's, it's just one more wonderful, rich resource with so much variety. And, and they do have these mechanisms to help lead you to other related items, which I just think helps kind of open up the research for you. Number five are records related to your ancestors' work. Um, I always think these are really interesting. And one of the really cool things you don't run into every day are these trade journals. And Internet Archive has a lot of different trade journals. So you could put in the term trade journal. Um, you could first start by searching for location and then go from there. But they list a lot of people in here. Um, a lot of the businesses they were associated with, uh, activities that were going on, super interesting. And this one happens to be back from 1900 from San Francisco. Um, so <laughs> advanced news. So they were listing like there's apartments for rent. So you're coming to work here. You're in, you want to be in this trade in this town. Here's where you might want to go live. So pretty cool items. How about the CCC? This is known as the Civilian Conservation Corps. I'm sure many of you have at some point heard about some ancestor who uh, worked through this program for a period of time. Yes, there are items for the CCC over at Internet Archive. Uh, just going on the name. Now, when I first started, I put in CCC and that, of course, got all kinds of stuff that had nothing to do with it. So I go ahead and put the name in. You could even try and then put quotes around it. Um, play with it a little bit, maybe add a location, but there are some neat items here and also, again, quite a variety. So we see photos, but we also see uh, audio and video interviews with people who worked with the CCC back in the day. Uh, along that kind of lines is the Works Progress Administration, the WPA. My grandfather worked with them uh, back in the 1930s, I think. And so this is actually how this kind of got, this train of thought got on my mind was I started thinking about him and trying to find some things. He had worked on Hoover Dam and there were several items. I mean, a couple of thousand items here just under Works Progress Administration. If you know there was a particular project they worked on, then you might want to try and put that project name and then just put WPA. So you might get something different. We're really relying on the knowledge of the person who's digitizing it and getting it onto the Internet Archive to tag it properly, put in the right metadata, use the right terminology, and spell it correctly. I know, they, they have so much on their shoulders, but you know we have to kind of give them a little bit of wiggle room and come at our searches in a couple of different directions. 
so we don't miss stuff. How are you doing? Oh my gosh, let me go look at chat here in our live show. Oh, we've got people who, yes, whose grandfather worked with the CCC and so records there. It's amazing what's out there and what, how fortunate we are that so much of it is available online now. Um, okay, number six, military records. Now, this is not your first place to go for military records. Certainly some a website like fold3.com would be or something like that. But there are interesting and unique items here. So one, now this, this came to me um, because one of my listeners of the Genealogy Gems podcast, I hope that you listen to the show. There's an app, go in your app store and look up Genealogy Gems. Um, she wrote me and she said that I think it was her great uncle. I'm not sure I, off the top of my head, but she had written and said that they had been part of this American Forces Network. And it was like a radio show that they did. So we did some searching and found some audio from the episodes that she that uh, her relative had been a part of. So that was really amazing. And if your uh, grandfathers or um, grandmothers were in some way involved in uh, World War II or that type of thing, they might have been on a show, they might have been interviewed, they might have been part of a, a group that was being highlighted, they may have been singing as hers was, go in and just type in American Armed, uh, or American Forces Network. And you'll find many different kind of items here. Something else I thought that was really interesting was going back to thinking about location in conjunction with military. So I didn't know what the right military terms would be to look up information about Bill's father's service in the Aleutian Islands uh, during World War II. He was in the Navy. So I thought, okay, well, the Aleutian Islands, that's a pretty unique place. Uh, there aren't lots of them. So I could put that in and start there and then see. So I started there with Aleutian Island. Then I went to the filter over on the left. And a lot of times you'll always see 2010, 2009, 2008, and you'll think, oh, it's all new stuff. Click more. There's a little link called more at the bottom of that section. And you'll find there may be a huge screen full of all the different dates that you can select. So I went through and I just selected that kind of World War II time frame and a little bit after just in case there were reporting about uh, the activities in the Aleutian Islands during that time. And I got a nice eclectic mix of really unique information I've not seen other places. Um, I've seen one of the newsreels, I think I saw it over at Ancestry, um, but they have other ones here as well. And one of them even mentioned the ship that Bill's father was um, a member of. So really cool. Think about different ways. I can't stress it enough on how you're going to search for this stuff. Don't be afraid to use those quotation marks. I like trying both. Put them on, take them off see what the difference is. And then sometimes you just have to kind of do that um, foot search where you kind of walk through and browse through each item to look more specifically. Here, they have this huge collection of the Veterans Administration pension payment cards. Where do these come from? How come they're on the internet archive? They're there because of the folks over at the Allen County Public Library Genealogy Center. And you'll remember Allison Singleton was here on the show in episode 31. So they use Internet Archive as a place to kind of host the content. So it takes, you know, money and time and space to host all this stuff. So put it on the cloud. That's what I mean by hosting it. So they get the digitization going and sometimes the Internet Archive will help them and then they will host it on their servers, which, of course, takes up a lot of space. Here's what's interesting about this. I was excited about telling you about it because there are just tons of rolls of microfilm that have been digitized and page by page and tons of names. In looking at it, Internet Archive probably isn't the best place to actually search these. I tried. So we have to think about this in this way. If you run into content 
on Internet Archive. And you look at it and you think, well, this is fine, but I can't find the role with the M's. That's what I was trying to do, finding Mansfield. And um, I would kept clicking. Well, the way they labeled, the way they titled their files, they almost all look the same, right? And the unique information about what section of the roles that they were doing was way at the end where you can't even see it. You have to click through every time. It became really totally inefficient to do it that way. So and I tell you this because be aware, yes, there's lots of stuff like this. And if you've got time on your hands, you could do it. But in this case, as I got frustrated and realized this is not so easy and I, I'm not finding a way to narrow this down so I can see which one to click without taking up tons of time, I then look to see who, who who sponsored this? And it was Allen County Public Library. Well, that's your clue. Go check out their website. Chances are, if you're finding a big collection like this at Internet Archive, it's probably also available through the website. And the website has a lot more incentive to make sure that it's usable, findable, searchable. So that's exactly the case. It's going to be easier to comb through information over at their, at the hosting website. Um, I say hosting, I'm confusing things. At the sponsoring website, let's say, the folks who said, here's our materials, let's get them digitized and online. Their website's so much better to do this, to, to try to find it. So it's not you. It's just a matter of understanding how did it get there? Why is it in this format? And maybe it's somewhere else. This is my clue that these are available, but this might not be the right place to be really digging in for a specific search. I'm going to go back to the sponsor, uh, the Allen County Public Library, and see if I can get a better search mechanism over at their website. Okay, keep that in mind. It's not you. I spent some time getting frustrated with that, so, but it's a really cool collection. Number seven Kind of interesting, and this one is one that uh, you read about in my book because Google has a Google Patents collection, correct? Well, I thought it was interesting that Internet Archive does as well. So when you're looking for unique records like uh, a patent for an invention or something that somebody is working on, uh, it's nice to know that there are a couple of different options of places to go. If you don't see it at Google Patents, come check out Internet Archive because you might find it here as well. And you might find items that are unique at either location. So we think of it as focus on the record collection and then have your, your um, assortment of different places to go look for those items. So very unique. They have um, all kinds of different ones. Some of them are very recent. Some of them go way back. They all come from the United States Patent and Trademark Office. So, uh, gosh, look at this, 409,000. That's a lot. All right. So, and you know, something to think about with patents is that you don't have to have an ancestor who's the inventor. They could just be an associate, a sponsor, um, you know, that kind of thing. So they could be named in a patent. If you know they were working in a particular industry or involved in the early stages of um, a particular invention, it might still be going and worth looking up that patent to see if by chance they had even more involvement. Number eight, this is a genealogical record collection that we see quite often uh, in many different locations, probate records. These are the records, of course, generated at the end of a person's life and Internet Archive has some unique probate records. So not a lot, but I want to just kind of get it on your radar that if you're really struggling and you, and you feel like it's out there, but you haven't found it somewhere else, it's worth a shot. Go check the Internet Archive because it's free. So you might as well go and see. And it's, it is, you got a few minutes, it's kind of some interesting reading. Even to read the, the probate records sometimes of people who were well known in a particular community where your ancestor was very involved. Like I think about Winthrop, Minnesota. So Bill's great-grandfather um, was uh, the mayor. He was the census enumerator in Winthrop. Um, he was very involved. He had a business. But it's also interesting to see the probate records of other people from that town because sometimes they mentioned him. They said, we owe 
LJ Larson money from the hardware store. So some money needs to go there, you know, that kind of thing or property. So it's interesting to read sometimes these probate documents from the community at large. Um, there are some here, it looks like Essex, Massachusetts, if that's on your radar is one that you need there. They certainly have them right here at the top of the screen. So just kind of putting on your radar that my goodness, there's such a wide range. And when you click through, this is an example of that thumbnail button I mentioned to you. Now remember that's in the bottom right hand corner of your viewer. It looks like a checkerboard. We click that and we get a nice kind of quick overview to see what kinds of information might be listed here. This happens to be an index. Okay, so that and it goes way back 1731. So this is indexing the probate records for the county. So this could lead you to then being able to track down your ancestors specific records, because these rec these indexes are um, on Internet Archive. All right. Gosh, we're getting already towards the end, but this is one of my favorites. It always is um, audio and video. And that is our ninth really interesting records over at the Internet Archive. They have a ton of audio and video. Now, it's not always the easiest to dig into, but I think you might be surprised how often people in your family somehow turn up in this stuff. Um, it's not as unusual as you think, because if you think about it, everyday people are involved in lots of different things and they might be staying in the background. They might have been um, interviewed as man on the street, you know, by the local radio station or TV station. Here's just a kind of a, a quick little um, overview of just some of the kinds of things you can find. So this first one here for audio, now this is just audio. So this is somebody has taken old, you know, reel to reels, and then we had cassettes, and I don't even know if people ever record onto a track tape, but they've digitized the audio and put it here. And this one, now this looked to me like it came from a library. Yes, the, the Boynton Beach City Library Local History Archives. So this was an oral history interview done in 1992, but it was somebody who was born in 1909, Leslie Burdick Crane. And you can click the play button, just like you do with the podcast over at my website and listen to him tell his story. I love seeing when the people who upload this information take the time to put in all these details. See the biographical note there? It's that text that makes things findable. So when you're thinking about putting old home movies on YouTube, uploading family history information to Internet Archive, keep in mind, people can't search on what he's saying in the audio. They're totally relying on the text that you associate with your item. So if you want to help people find your stuff, you got to put lots of great details name, date, place, uh, time frame, all that kind of stuff. Anything that somebody might be searching on that makes you notice it yourself, right? As you're searching, it's like, oh, if they would just put the name of the town or the last name, I would be able to find more information. So be thinking about that if you're trying to share your stuff. I hope you are sharing a lot of your family history. You probably have other people's family history in yours. Also here, look at this. There's tons of old radio shows. These are kind of fun. Now, I don't know if your ancestors were ever part of the radio shows, but I just like listening to them. <laughs> it's very relaxing on a Saturday afternoon. I'm, you know, cleaning the house or something. Here's Texas Rangers. Oh my gosh, there's tons and tons of old radio shows. I had some fun. My grandfather, I was looking through an interview I did with him. We used to write letters. So I would write him questions and he would answer. And he would tell me about his favorite radio programs and his favorite songs. And I have been able to find so many of them right here on the Internet Archive. And this is a really fun way to introduce uh, the next generations in your family to what was entertainment like on a cold, cold morning um, with nothing else to do or school is closed, you know, what would people do? They would listen to the radio 
And um, I just think it's really fun. I, I think it's uh, kind of a neat way to give them that experience of what our ancestors would have enjoyed. And speaking of music, um, I have old reel-to-reel audio of Bill's grandfather playing uh, the violin. He used to play in the silent film um, orchestra for them at the movies. And one of his songs that we have, we identify, was called I'll See You in My Dreams. I talked about this on my podcast, and they have a couple of different versions of this audio recording. There is a huge, huge collection of old 78s being digitized and the old cylinders. So remember the old Edison cylinders? Tons of those. And some of those are not just music. They're actually people talking, just people, you know, being interviewed or whatever. And of course, the audio archive, this is just a a small sample of what you might be able to find. Video. Okay, so I mentioned uh, Bill's great grandfather, L.J. Larson, and you can see the pictures here. Here's his wife, uh, Helen, with his mother, Lillian. So I went to Internet Archive and I just looked up Winthrop, Minnesota, and I put quotes around it, and I see this old film. This was yesterday that I was doing this, and I clicked on it. Look at this the 1954 Dairy Day Parade. I love that these people, they filmed the front page of the newspaper first to say what was going on and some of the flyers in town, they were having this big event. So yes, I watched the whole thing yesterday. Gosh, so a lot of it was in color, lots of people. They just filmed a lot of people, but check this out. Here comes the tractor. That says L.J. Larson and Company. I just think that's so cool. So... Who knows? Your family history could just float by in a video. <laughs> Take some time. And, and I, I tell you, there were at least two people in this video that I really recognized because I've looked at so many of the family photos as I was digitizing them. And this person, whoever filmed this, did a ton of faces. Many people kind of scurried off. They were so shy. But now I'm really going to have some fun revisiting my photo collection and going back and spotting some of the people here. Um, Amazing. So YouTube is not your only place to find old video, right? Internet Archive is absolutely it. So the final thing I want to mention to you, it's really not a record collection, but well, it's a collections. It's the fact that they have collections on Internet Archive, and this is a wonderful way to more quickly find um, lots of stuff that you're interested in. So collections can be that one entity came together, let's say it's Allen County Public Library or a conglomerate of Canadian libraries. They work together and they kind of like have a channel, if you will, on Internet Archive. So these are collections. When you get to the homepage, you'll see the top collections. These are the ones that are getting most visited. But also you'll notice Right here, where it gives you the little symbols for the different types of media that they have, text, audio, video, um, software, pictures, the last one that looks like a checklist is collections. And that's a super easy way to kind of get to the whole series of collections that are available if you click that. Another way you can find them and search by them is to go to the advanced search. So click that, it's always right underneath that search box And this is a great place to go if you're struggling, trying to find what you want, you've um, done some of the basics like quotation marks, come in here and you can search by collection. So under collection, I just typed in the word genealogy to see what I could find. You can also search for titles and look down below there, date range. You'll notice that when you use the filter, they'll have all these check boxes year by year. It is so inefficient. (laughs) It just takes forever to check every little box I check. There's no way to like check them all. The way to do it is to get a time frame is to come into advanced search and specify the from this year to that year. And you have to give it a month and a date. Doesn't matter. Just put January 1st for the year, but put the time, the date range. So, but here, if I put in, you know, genealogy collection, Over 40,000, almost 41,000 items are just in the collection of genealogy. So from there, you could start to whittle down. But it's a nice way to just get oriented to what they have. 
Here's another example of a collection. Now, this is one you've probably heard about, Reclaim the Records. So these folks work really hard to get access to, hard to get access to records and get them digitized and get them up online. And so you could check out the Reclaim the Records collection. Lots of folks I saw, I saw Amy's from here from New York. We've got a couple other New Yorkers, lots of New York stuff there. So check it out. American Libraries is a wonderful collection of many other channels. So if you think of them as channels or, or folders within folders, you're gonna see the California Digital Library, the Boston Library, the Getty Research. Okay, so get to American Libraries and go through and see if you see a collection there. If you click one, you can go into their specific collection. So here's an example of the San Francisco Public Library has their collection with over 13,000 items. Okay, so this is one of those things where you might have kind of wondered, why, am I, why don't I find much at the Internet Archive? And I think going through collections is a great way to get started. I know we have lots of Canadians in our chat. I've seen them. I know. <laughs> and um, I am and all of our folks. I think Nancy's up in Canada, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, so Canadian Libraries has a wonderful collection. And within that one, each one of these libraries has their own collections as well. When you see the little checklist icon, you know you're looking at a collection, not an individual record. And how about newspapers? Oh my gosh, almost 400,000. So get to the newspaper collection. Don't worry, in the show notes, put it on your checklist this weekend, on the show notes at my website, genealogygems.com slash 11s is, you'll click on this episode, which is 43, and I'll have the links to many of these specific direct, um, collections so that you can do one click and you can get right there, okay? And go start checking out the newspapers. And one of our favorites, gotta end with a bang here, Books to Borrow, okay? So Books to Borrow is a huge collection, over two million, and here's how it works. We're gonna go in the search box and type in Books to Borrow, click Go, Okay, so there's lots here that you can borrow, but notice the very first one has the collection icon on it, that little button. So this is the full collection. Again, the link will be in the show notes. You can click about, it'll explain kind of how this works. And uh, if you need Adobe to be able to read some of the PDFs, that kind of thing. In the collection, we can do a search. I'm gonna type in Huntingtonshire. So um, this is a county, an old county, in England, and 14 items. I gotta tell you, I was I was pretty amazed because some of these books, like this one here, I've seen them on eBay, and sometimes they're a little expensive, and I'm like, I don't wanna pay for that. But it's on Books to Borrow. So when you first look at it, you go, oh, I can't look at it. This is why you need the free account. So make sure that you get signed into your free account, and then you can go click Borrow. Okay, so you can see that I'm, lo I'm logged in, click borrow for one hour, and it tells you, hey, if you need it longer than an hour, click it again, you'll get to borrow it another hour. They just don't want you to have it sit on your computer forever and not be available to other people. So this one, all these old pictures back from hunts that would be just the same time frame that the cooks lived there. And I found some wonderful, wonderful pictures in here. Again, we can just flip through it like a regular book. We can click our thumbnail view to kind of get an idea. Yep, it's all photos and descriptions and little stories of the people who lived in that area. So Books to Borrow is so cool. And look, you can return it. If you're done, you just click Return Now. And it will tell you that it ends. So if you forget to click Return Now, it's going to end at the end of your hour. But if you need it longer, you can click and Renew. Okay? So, hey, you guys, in the comments uh, for this video, when you get done watching, if you're here on YouTube, uh, go down in the comments and talk about maybe some of the things you have found, maybe something that you heard about that you're excited to go check out. If you're on the Genealogy Gems website, go down in the comments at the below of the show notes and do the same. I'd love to hear from you. That's it. My gosh. And it took <laughs> just under the hour, but we got through 10 really cool areas of records that you could jump into right now at the Internet Archive. I have a feeling, I have a feeling you're going to be busy this weekend. You think? Very cool. Let me head over to chat really quick and just kind of see 
what our live audience is doing. Oh, now very cool. Janice says that she, it was, she was given the option to do one hour or 14 days. So that's awesome. People were finding Devonshire. Okay. Yeah, rabbit chasing. <laughs> very cool. Let me look really quick and see if there's any just quick questions of something I can answer. Can you bookmark items or save them to an area to look at later without having to search for them again? Yes, absolutely. So that's what the favorites is all about. Make sure that you're logged in to your free account with Internet Archive and then just click favorites and that'll put it in that queue so that you can jump right back into it. I think you'll retrieve your favorites up in the upper right hand corner of the screen. Just click on where it shows that you're logged in and I think that you'll be able to get to it from there. Well, the time has gone by so fast. Do, do me a favor. If you enjoyed it, if you learned something new, um, one, tell your friends. Will you do that for me? Tell your friends. Go out and share. Uh, when you get on the show notes page, share it out on Facebook. Let people know that, hey, there's stuff over here going on that's going to help you with your family history. And of course, I would so appreciate too if you would click subscribe. I, you guys have done a wonderful job with that. Let's get it up to... Let's switch it from 38% to 62% are subscribed at least. The more subscribers we have, the more that YouTube helps put our videos out in front of other family history folks. And uh, that is wonderful. And it really supports this show. Gosh, Sally says, just found an amazing doc in Internet Archive that gives the history of an early American family by the son of the granddaughter of the man who was a brother to my ancestor. Wow. Wow is right. I'm going to be going through the live chat and on the show notes, I will um, put any answers that I can provide to any questions that you have. And um, until next time, have fun digging through the internet archive. And um, thank you so much for joining me here. I always love seeing you. Have a wonderful week with those you love. Talk to you soon.